Hi, I'm Lydia McGrew. My recently published book is called The Mirror or the Mask, Liberating the Gospels from Literary Devices. This book has two sides to its project. The one side involves arguing against some views that I call the literary device views or compositional device views of the Gospels. According to these views, which I argue against, the Gospel authors felt free because of the standards of their time, the literary standards of their day, to alter their stories somewhat. They might bring a character in who wasn't present or move things by day or time. We'll see a lot of examples today of what's involved in that. The second part of my project is positive, and in that part of my project, I provide a lot of positive evidence that the Gospels are meticulous, literally historical documents. Dr. Michael Lacona is a scholar who's advocated some of the views that I argue against in the Mirror of the Mask, also known as Timon. And he's recently produced a series of videos in which he claims to respond to my work in The Mirror of the Mask and even to refute it. In this series of videos, of which this is the first one, I will be responding in return. But I want to emphasize that there is no substitute for reading The Mirror of the Mask itself. The case is laid out there in meticulous detail. Each of these videos will have a blog post, and that'll be linked down below the video, that you can click on for further details. There will even be a couple of extra blog posts, but none of that is a substitute for the case in the Mirror of the Mask. In fact, several of the things that Dr. Lacona addresses have already been addressed in greater detail in the Mirror of the Mask. The phrases that I use for these literary devices that I don't think the gospel authors used include things like fictionalizing literary devices, fact-changing literary devices, fact-altering, changing historical facts, that sort of thing. These are meant to be descriptive phrases. They don't build in the assumption that it didn't happen. Readers may be struck with surprise at the thought that the gospel authors oft altered the facts, but we still have to discuss whether they did or not. And that's why I wrote a 546 page book arguing that they didn't. I don't mean to build that into the terminology itself. In his series of videos, Dr. Lacona has objected repeatedly to this terminology. So in this video, I'll be addressing that. One of the devices that's pretty illustrative is the claim that the author John moved Jesus' cleansing of the temple. On this theory, which I disagree with, the real cleansing of the temple took place at the end of Jesus' ministry, and there was only one. But John decided, possibly for symbolic or literary reasons, to move it to the beginning of Jesus' ministry and narrate it as if it occurred then. Uh, and we need to be clear, this is not simply that John narrated topically and was not trying to indicate a chronology. On the theory, he actually moved it in time. Now, I think it's pretty evident when you put the Gospels together that Jesus cleansed the temple twice, but this illustrates why I call these fact-altering or fictionalizing literary devices. An analogy for these devices that Dr. Lacona himself uses is a movie based on true events. So you might go to such a movie and you would know that it was partially historical. It's not like it's all fiction or even mostly fiction, but certain things may have been changed. An event that really took place in 1977 might be portrayed in the movie as taking place in 1974. In the movie Chariots of Fire, which is based on the events of an Olympics in the 1920s, they even invent a character, Lord Lindsay, who didn't really exist. He's only loosely based on a couple of historical characters. So that's an example of the kind of thing we're talking about. And the audience is supposedly expected that such things might be changed. But I want to be clear, even the original audiences on the theory did not have what we might call a decoder ring. Just as when you watch a movie based on true events, you don't know exactly which things have been changed. If you wanted to find that out, you would go look it up on Google or Wikipedia or in some more realistically historical source. And usually nowadays, we're lucky enough to have one of those available. But the Gospels supposedly are our historical sources for the life of Jesus. So this makes it very hard to go and look up somewhere else to find out which of these things happened that way and which didn't. And the original audience on the theory would have been in pretty much that same situation. Supposedly, they just didn't mind. Now, some of the claims, as we'll see, are bigger and some are smaller. 
I've never tried to say that they are all of the same degree of change. Some of them are small details and some of them are larger, according as the author supposedly felt free to craft his narrative. But Dr. Lacona objects to the terminology on the grounds that allegedly the changes are not essential. What he has said in his recent series of videos is that we should only call it fact-changing if it changes the essence of the story. And if it doesn't change the essence of the story or the essence of Jesus' message or something of that kind, we should not call it fact-changing. This is a fairly subjective standard. Not everyone's going to agree as to what counts as the essence of the story or the essence of the message. And it seems odd that we should have to decide first what's the essence of the story and then decide whether to call something a fact or not. For example, if a movie changed something from 1977 to 1974, you would say that fact was changed, even though it might not change the essence of the story. In fact, we would actually probably call it fictional. That date is fictional. Uh, that would not be an insult to the movie makers. It would just be a description. Because there have been so many objections to this terminology, what I'm doing in this video is giving some examples of the kinds of changes in question. And then you can decide for yourself whether fact-changing is an accurate description. It also gives the listener a chance to decide for themselves whether these are important or unimportant. Some of them may seem more important than others, but it seems that in the recent series of videos, Dr. Lacona is emphasizing more of the, the smaller changes to the story that he believes have taken place. I'd like to give a wider range of examples. Another example that has been advocated both by Dr. Michael Lacona and by Dr. Craig Keener concerns the day of the month, the Jewish month, on which Jesus was crucified. According to this, John wanted to portray Jesus as the Lamb of God in a more direct fashion. And so according to this theory, which I think is incorrect, John moved the day of Jesus' crucifixion back by a day in the month so that he would be crucified on the day when the Passover lambs were slain, even though in history he really wasn't. Now that would also necessarily mean moving the Last Supper back by a day, because if you move one, you have to move the other. Here's what Dr. Lacona says about that. John appears deliberate in his attempts to lead his readers to think the Last Supper was not a Passover meal. And if we were to read John's gospel apart from any knowledge of the synoptics, we would regard John as reporting that Jesus was crucified prior to the celebration of the Passover meal. There is a plausible reason for this. Some scholars think John altered the day and time of Jesus' crucifixion in order to emphasize theological points, specifically that Jesus is the burnt offering for sins and the Passover lamb. In this view, John has displaced the day and time of Jesus' crucifixion. Plutarch may have made a similar or chronological move in reference to Julius Caesar. It's very striking here that Dr. Lacona emphasizes that John appears deliberate in his attempt to lead his readers to believe that the Last Supper and hence the crucifixion took place on a different day when it actually took place. This emphasizes what I have also pointed out, which is that the original readers did not have an easy way to tell what had been done. In order to figure this out, they would have supposedly had to compare John to the synoptics, decide that they were narrating different days, and then decide which one was actually historical. That makes it pretty hard to decide what happened. Does this count as a fact change? You decide. Another such claim that Dr. Lacona endorses is that Luke in his gospel, geographically moves Jesus' first appearance to his disciples from Galilee region, which is quite a number of days walk, down to Jerusalem. So in Luke, Jesus first appears to his disciples in his group of disciples in Jerusalem on the very evening of Easter day. Matthew in Matthew 28 narrates an appearance in Galilee by appointment, in fact, because they go to a mountain that it said Jesus had appointed to them. I think it's obvious that these are different meetings, but Dr. Lacona insists that they are the same meeting and that Luke has moved one of them south to Jerusalem, which would also change the circumstances. Matthew's meeting is expected. Luke's is unexpected. Matthew's is apparently outdoors. Luke's is indoors. Matthew's is 
sometime later, if we put it together with John more than a week later, Luke's, which is also echoed in John 20, is on that very same night. So the circumstances are changed. Dr. Lacona advocated this theory in a debate with skeptic scholar Bart Ehrman, who was not slow to pick up on the implication that this is nonetheless accurate in Luke. Here's how that dialogue went. Lacona, I think that first appearance probably happened in Galilee, but Luke situates it in Jerusalem there. Ehrman, so the appearance was in Galilee, but Luke says it was in Jerusalem, and you think that's accurate? Lacona, yeah, he's compressing the accounts. Ehrman, what would make it inaccurate? Lacona, he appeared to them in Africa? Now that quip about appearing in Africa did get a laugh from the audience, but as you can see, the change of circumstances is quite extensive. In fact, there's another application of this. What about doubting Thomas? Can we imagine doubting Thomas walking several days' journey north to Galilee when he doesn't even believe that Jesus has risen at all? Did the disciples supposedly see Jesus in Galilee and then send a message to doubting Thomas saying, we've seen the Lord, and Thomas walked all the way up to Galilee just in case he would run into him? That's not how John portrays it at all. John unabashedly locates both of those first two appearances in Jerusalem a week apart. Jack Lacona doesn't address that question, but in one place in his book, Why Are There Differences in the Gospels?, he does suggest that it's possible that John may have made up the entire Doubting Thomas sequence. He narrowly rejects that view in favor of, instead, the view that Luke has conflated two accounts. Here's what he says. Moreover, with Judas now dead, there were 11 main disciples. Thus, Luke 24, 33 can speak of Jesus' first appearance to a group of his male disciples as including the 11 and those with them. However, John 20, 19 through 24 tells us Thomas was absent during that event. Thus, only 10 of the main disciples would have been present. Accordingly, either Luke conflated the first and second appearances to the male disciples, or John crafted the second appearance in order to rebuke those who, like Thomas, heard about Jesus' resurrection and failed to believe. It seems more probable in this instance that Luke has conflated the first and second appearances of Jesus to his male disciples. Elsewhere in talking about conflation as a literary device, Dr. Lacona explicitly describes it as deliberate conflation. So here he is quite deliberate and quite definite that either Luke deliberately pushed together two of the meetings or John made up Doubting Thomas out of whole cloth. The more common harmonization is that Luke is using the term the 11 to refer to a group that is not necessarily a counting term. That and other solutions are rejected by Dr. Lacona, and these two are his finalist theories. I consider this to be giving a lot more plausibility to the hypothesis that John invented Doubting Thomas and to the hypothesis that Luke deliberately conflated two meetings. In any event, would you call either of those fact-altering? Changing the facts? I would say so. What do you think? Dr. Kona thinks that there is a irreconcilable conflict between Matthew's narrative and John's narrative concerning where Jesus first met Mary Magdalene after he rose from the dead. Matthew 28 narrates the meeting of a group of women with Jesus when they're running with joy away from the tomb to tell the disciples that Jesus is risen. He doesn't explicitly say that Mary Magdalene is with them. At the beginning of the chapter, Matthew narrates that Mary Magdalene went to the tomb, and then from there on, he uses the word they. They saw the angel, and they, the women, or they, were running away from the tomb. He doesn't mention the fact, which we learn only from John, that Mary Magdalene apparently left the group. John narrates Mary Magdalene returning after summoning Peter and John and still grieving, still believing that Jesus is not risen and that his body has simply been taken away. She then has a dialogue with Jesus, whom she at first mistakes for the gardener. This is a completely different circumstance in which Mary meets Jesus from the circumstance in which the women meet Jesus in Matthew. Dr. Lacona is quite insistent that both of these are portraying Mary Magdalene's meeting with Jesus, which is obviously incompatible. 
And so he rejects all harmonization, such as the one that I just suggested here. And he says this, at minimum, it appears that either Matthew or John has relocated the appearance to Mary Magdalene. This shows the extent to which at least one of the evangelists or the sources from which he drew felt free to craft the story. Notice that he's emphasizing there that this shows the freedom that the authors had to craft the story. So this is not just a trivial matter, because if John relocated, that's the terminology, he made up an entire scene. That would be the invention of a scene because the premise is entirely different from the scene where the women are running with joy and meet Jesus. Would John's relocating in that way, or Matthew's deliberately trying to say that Mary Magdalene was with them, be changing the facts? You decide. I think it's pretty clear. Dr. Lacona and Dr. Craig Keener have even suggested that Matthew may have added a blind man to a healing of Jesus and a demoniac to another healing who were not present on that occasion, doubling up on them. This is meant to account for the fact that when those healings are narrated in Mark, he mentions only one blind man and only one demoniac. And when they're narrated in Matthew, he mentions two blind man, men and he mentions two demoniacs. Here's what Dr. Lacona says. Was Matthew using a different source? Or did he seek to illustrate multiple demons by adding a second demoniac? It is difficult to know. Perhaps Matthew has doubled up the demoniac in order to compensate for not telling the story of Jesus healing another demoniac mentioned earlier in Mark 1, 21 through 28. Concerning the blind men, he says, as we observed in the previous pericope, Matthew, who was given to abbreviating Mark, may have doubled up on the number of blind men in order to include another story from Mark 8, 22 through 26 of Jesus healing the blind that Matthew will not otherwise mention. Now, I call this the game token view of Jesus' ministry. You have a game board, which is Jesus' ministry, and you have a certain number of blind men healed tokens, and you have a certain number of demoniac healed tokens. And Mark has a demoniac healed here, and then in a different story, at a different place on the game board, he has different demoniac healed. And Matthew um, takes one of those demoniacs and moves it over to this story. So you still have the same number of game token demoniacs healed. And the same way with the blind men in Jericho that Matthew is doubling up to allegedly compensate for not telling a completely different story in Mark. But the people that Jesus healed in the Gospels are not game tokens. They're real people, and the Gospels tell us the stories of how they really were healed at real specific places and times. If Matthew carried out this activity that Dr. Lacona is suggesting here, would that be changing the facts? Obviously, I think it would be. But you think about it and you decide. Dr. Lacona has even suggested here again, apparently following Craig Keener's commentary on Matthew, that Matthew may have created an entire doublet incident of the healing of the blind in Matthew chapter 9. In New Testament studies, a doublet is an incident that is duplicated within a gospel. So you think of it, it's a little bit like uh, doing save as in a document in a word processing program, and then you make changes to one of the documents and you turn it into a different document. Similarly, the idea of a doublet is that the gospel author duplicated the incident, but then made changes to one of them so that it appears to be a different incident, but really only one of them took place and narrates both in his gospel. Here's what Dr. Lacona says about the possibility that there's a doublet of healing of the blind in Matthew. But Matthew 20, 29 through 34 may have a doublet in 9, 27 to 31. Accordingly, Matthew may have included the doublet, although with variations, he would repeat later in 20, 29 through 34 to provide an example of Jesus healing the blind as evidence for Jesus being the Messiah. In Jesus' ministry, John the Baptist has a moment of doubt and he sends his messengers to ask, are you the one who should come or should we look for another? And Jesus says, tell John the Baptist what you see. And he lists various things, including the blind receive their sight. The earlier healing of the blind in Matthew takes place prior to the coming of those messengers of John the Baptist. So that's what this is alluding to concerning evidence of Jesus being the Messiah. I must say that I have my doubts whether Matthew would have considered it to be 
evidence of anything if it didn't really happen. Craig Blomberg, the New Testament scholar I mentioned earlier, unabashedly calls doublets a theory of fictitious narratives. That's just a terminology he's using. That's just a description. So if Matthew did this, would that be fictionalizing? You decide. This idea of doublet and the idea of doubling the blind men that I mentioned a moment ago are just both presented by Dr. Lacone as part of a sort of a menu of options of things that may be happening in Matthew. He doesn't decide about them definitely, but he treats them as these very live options and just doesn't really decide what the explanation is for um, the two different incidents or the multiple blind men in Matthew when there is only one in Mark and so forth. So these are apparently the kinds of things that would be these compositional devices. In fact, Craig Keener claims that the doubling of the uh, blind men would be the compositional device of inflection. He mentions that in his recent book, Christobiography. Finally, let's look at a couple of things that allegedly fall under the heading of paraphrase. Now, Dr. Lacona is not the only scholar that I discuss in The Mirror or the Mask. I also discuss Dr. Craig Evans. In 2012, Dr. Evans had a debate with Bart Ehrman again, and he had quite a number of remarks about the Gospel of John. Here is something that he said about the Gospel of John and the I am sayings with what are called predicates, such as I am the light of the world, I am the true vine. On a historical level, let us suppose we could go back into time with a camera team and audio and video record the historical Jesus, and we followed him about throughout his ministry. I would be very surprised if we caught him uttering, I am this and I am that, and one of these big, long speeches that we find in John. This aspect of the Gospel of John, I would not put in the category of historical. It's a genre question. So you could say, theologically, these affirmations of who Jesus is, in fact, do derive from Jesus, not because he walked around and said them, but because of what he said, what he did, and because of his resurrection. And so this community that comes together in the aftermath of Easter says, you know what, this Jesus, this Jesus who said these various things, whose teaching we cling to and interpret and present and adapt and so on, he is for us the way, the truth, the life the true vine, he is the bread of life, and so on. This has been characterized as paraphrase. Dr. Evans is an evangelical scholar. I had a debate with him two years ago on the British Unbelievable show, and he characterized his view of John as paraphrase. I will be returning in a later video to a discussion of this matter of paraphrase. Dr. Lacona, though saying he would not go quite as far as Dr. Evans does, has also characterized this type of view as paraphrase. And Finally, in the category of paraphrase, allegedly, here is what Dr. Lacona himself has said about Jesus saying from the cross, I thirst. For the next to last Logion, it appears that John has redacted, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me to say I am thirsty? So on this view, Jesus did not historically say I thirst. Rather, John was, shall we say, inspired by the saying, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? To think of spiritual thirst and portray Jesus as if he said, I thirst. Those familiar with that passage in John may remember that the onlookers go to get something for Jesus to drink when he says this. So it's quite clear that John is portraying him as literally expressing thirst. Thirst would also have been a very well-known uh, part of the tortures of crucifixion. In this theory, Dr. Lacona is following Dr. Daniel Wallace, another evangelical scholar who originally suggested this alleged paraphrase or what they call a dynamic equivalent transformation in John. If the Yoanin community did what Dr. Evans describes, if John did what Dr. Lacona describes for I thirst, would this be changing the facts? I think it's quite clear that it would be, but you decide. There are many more book examples of this in my book, many more examples of these compositional devices that are alleged. And if I simply used the word compositional device, it wouldn't be clear what kind I was talking about. Does it merely mean leaving out some details? No, I'm not opposed to leaving out details because leaving out isn't denying. So I wanted to add descriptive phrases. 
I think these examples show why I use that descriptive language, and it also shows that this isn't much ado about nothing. This is more important. And so, especially if you're inclined to think that it's no big deal and that perhaps Dr. Lacona has just shown that there were these compositional devices in the Gospels, this is definitely worth your while to look into further. And so I hope you'll watch the rest of these videos and get a hold of a copy of TMOM. Come back next time, and we'll be talking at that time about the genre of the Gospels. Thanks for watching.